We are Lars with Latitude. We are here to share our adventure in the Canadian Rockies this summer. We took our Heartland Torque 380 toy hauler and we were a little bit nervous before we went. We had lots of questions, so we're here to get all those questions answered for you today um, from our experience. The Rocky Mountains in Canada has been a, on our bucket list for a long time. We're so glad we went because the area was just really beautiful. Um, Jasper, I know, has been on my bucket list and, and Banff as well and we couldn't be happier. Our favorite part about Canada was the scenery. You've all seen the pictures of Banff National Park and Jasper and the Canadian Rockies. The Icefields Parkway was a huge highlight for us. Probably the most beautiful drive we've ever done. It was just stunning to be able to drive right next to glaciers and see these mountains and there was so many animals. I think we saw uh, 20 grizzly, or grizzly and black bears while we were in Canada this summer. So. We got to see a lot of wildlife. We just were really impressed with all of Canada. We didn't want to leave and we're still missing it now that we've left. Obviously we're not here anymore. We're in Utah, but we're here to just show you everything that we experienced. I just want to jump on here real quick before the video goes any further. If you're looking for more beautiful pictures and videos of Canada, hang with the video. I promise it gets better. We're just trying to give out as much information as possible to an RVer who wants to go up. Um, also, this video is sponsored by Heartland. They made an incredible torque here, um, and we're actually looking at their Cyclones or Road, War Road Warriors and their torque models uh, for the future. Uh, if you get a chance, check out their website. They make great RVs. Uh, we couldn't be happier with ours. So, back to the video. So, we started our journey from Laconner, Washington, and we crossed over at the Linden Border Crossing. It was actually a quieter crossing. We picked it on purpose because it wasn't the main crossing to go up into the Vancouver area. However, we thought it was gonna be easy. We were super optimistic and it didn't turn out to be great. Actually, the experience was kind of one of our worst border crossing experiences. We wanna share with you what we did to prepare, what documents you need to have, and also what to expect at the border. And the thing about border crossings is it kind of depends on who you get. So you might get somebody who's kind of crabby, which is what we got this time, <laughs> and kind of rude, which is what we got this time. Sometimes they're really nice, um, and I think that it does, doesn't does even, it's not country dependent. We have had this experience in numerous countries as just people are people. As we came into the border crossing, we were in line, and of course we waited, um, and then this lane was opening up. Uh, where we saw this guy, he waved us through, and we thought, yay, he just started, it's gonna be great. Uh, no, not so great. Uh, he had all the energy in the world and definitely wanted uh, to pick us apart. So he made us go park and go inside. We had to verify all the documents and they did a, a uh, inspection of our RV, which is basically they just walk in, it's loaded down with stuff anyway. It's hard to get around and all the slides are in, so there's not a lot to look at. Uh, unless they have us open the slides and do everything which they on uh, a border crossing we haven't been that unlucky yet not yet but i will say that they asked us do you have any drugs do you have any alcohol do you have any cannabis and do you have any tobacco so those were the only questions we got asked initially then we went in and we did um, they looked through our paperwork so the things that you need to have is a passport or a passport card and your passport shouldn't expire within six months of going into the country However, if you have a child and your child is 15 or under, you can use a birth certificate if crossing the border from the United States. Um, we had both of those because our passports were going to expire, but we ended up not needing them and they accepted the passports just fine. Pets, yeah, we have Apollo and Zeus, uh, cat and dog, and they just require healthy pets, uh, vaccination certificate. For rabies. For rabies. And, and just any kind of owner documentation. I'm guessing the, the rabies uh, certification probably would have counted, uh, would have had our names on it. But I don't know what that means. We didn't get asked for it though either. They didn't ask for our pet documentation, but we made sure to take care of it before we crossed the border just in case. Food at the border crossing. There's a PDF online that you can go through and you can look at all the regulations. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you all the different food items you can or cannot cross with because it often changes depending on things going on in the world. And also it's gonna be dependent on where you bought that food and what, what, if it was meat or if it was dairy. And so the regulations are all online and we're gonna post those in the description below. Next time we go, which we're probably definitely gonna go again, 
Um, I'm gonna do a Costco haul. You know, you do you. I'm not telling you any advice here, but I'm gonna do a Costco haul and get everything that I need because everything up there is quite expensive and we're gonna get to the prices here in a minute. Yeah, and I mean, they, they looked through our RV and didn't say anything about our plants or any food that we had. We kind of got rid of all the, the fresh produce that was on the counter, so they couldn't really access our fridge or anything. But yeah, we lucked out, they didn't pull open our slides. And so yeah, we would definitely come prepared with more food. Also, although our first impression of Canada, our Canadians was our border crossing agent, the women who went through our rig were actually pretty respectful and nice. And then everybody else we came across in Canada was really respectful and nice. We didn't have a problem with anybody while we were up there traveling. So uh, don't let a, you know, a border crossing scare you. All right, we made it to Canada. It only took about 20 minutes. Um, and they just, they hopped inside the truck, they hopped inside the, um, <laughs> yeah, they hopped inside. So that road right there is the United States, I guess. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But anyway, yeah, we're, we're here in Canada. It's about 1.30 in the afternoon, so we got plenty of time to get to our campsite, thankfully. I was worried they were going to try and pull everything out of the RV or make us put our slides out, and they really didn't. So, yeah, all good. Okay, so now we're gonna go over our route. We started in Washington and we crossed over um, and we went straight over to Cultus Lake, which is near Abbotsford uh, in BC. And we chose that location because there's a thousand trails there. But when we got there, what we realized was Cultus Lake was beautiful. And so we spent a few days there. And then we headed up Highway 5, making our way to Jasper National Park. We wanted to start with Jasper. This was late May. We wanted to get, uh, in June, we wanted to see Banff and Jasper so that we could get the bigger national parks out of the way before going and checking out all the provincial parks when the big summer crowds arrived. So we started in Jasper. So on the way to Jasper, I would recommend two stops. We stopped in Clearwater at the Wells Gray Provincial Park. You can actually take a road straight up north of Clearwater into Wells Gray Provincial Park and there are just waterfall after waterfall after waterfall and most of them you can just pull off with your car and get out and look at these overlooks and all the waterfalls are unique and different. We highly recommend you do that. It's a fun thing to do just one day and then you can move on up the road the next day and head towards Jasper again. You might wanna make a stop at Mount Robson. It's this gorgeous mountain you're gonna come around the corner and see and it would be the perfect place to stop and have lunch and check out the views. So then we got to Jasper. We spent a couple of weeks there. Okay, so we are taking a morning walk on the Whistler's Campground in Jasper, Alberta. We were going to boondock outside of Jasper, but the closest spots were at least an hour drive either way. So we realized with gas prices, it was kind of just silly to try and boondock. So we, um, came to Whistler's. Whistler's has anywhere from $29 night sites without any hookups up to like maybe 50 or 50 something dollars a night for electric hookups. So we just took no hookups. We don't really need anything. We're set up with solar and our site, let me see if I can show you, is right there. You can see us and there's not a ton of trees. Luckily when you're booking online, you have the option to look at pictures. So yeah. Yeah, so our Starlink and our solar is working great. So that hasn't been an issue. They actually have generator hours of 8 to 10 a.m. and 5 to 7 p.m. stopped on the way home to Athabasca Falls 
Don't know if I'm saying that right or not. Can't see it, but it's pretty powerful. Pretty nuts. And fun fact, the Athabasca flows north to the Arctic Ocean. So that's pretty incredible. Love it. Love it. to drive the Icefields Parkway south from Jasper to Banff National Park. We had no idea what to expect about the Icefields Parkway. All we knew is that it's this gorgeous place and it's in the mountains. So we assumed there was going to be lots of elevation gain and it was going to be kind of crazy. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute and we'll tell you what the roads were like. But we ended up loving all the roads in Canada. But this was our favorite. It was the most beautiful, I think. And we stopped at the uh, to camp halfway through and then drove down to Banff where we camped for another couple of weeks before heading over to Golden. And so we drove from Lake Louise to Golden through Yoho National Park with the RV. And then after that, we uh, stayed in Golden for a couple weeks and then we headed straight south back to the border to cross into um, the United States just north of Whitefish, Montana. Uh, sticking with roads, um, we've had a lot of questions about like the quality of roads, what are the grades, and you know what? The roads are just like the states. You're gonna get, for the most part, they're great. The grades, uh, again, weren't that bad. For the most part, you're driving the long stretches of road are gonna be through um, in the valley floors. Mm -hmm. So they're straight, um, so they're straight, they're pretty level, and it's just if you need to go over a ridge to get this other valley. Um, so the Columbia River Valley versus you know the Banff area, you're gonna have to go over a, a ridge there, uh, over a mountain, but they obviously put the roads in strategic places so the grades aren't that terrible. Yeah, I mean, we mostly encountered six, 7% grades, um, and then a couple of times we had an 8% grade, maybe around Kicking Horse Pass. So they weren't too bad, um, manageable, especially if you've been driving an RV before, but especially manageable because we also found that the roads were wide. They were wide enough that people were kind of pulling off on the shoulders, the shoulders were so wide. So um, we didn't feel like we encountered a lot of hairpin turns with the RV. As long as you're staying on the major highways, like you said, it's like the States. So this is a Heartland Torque uh, 380 and it's 43 feet long. and. For the most part, when you go up there, all you're going to see is smaller RVs. And when we get to the campgrounds, we'll talk about that. But all you see is smaller RVs. You rarely see rigs like that, this. Um, but we did great. We did fine uh, with a Ram uh, 3500 pulling this thing. We did great. Our three favorite drives you should drive with or without the RV are the Icefields Parkway. And then you must drive the Trans-Canadian Highway through Yoho National Park and Glacier National Park. You're just, you're in, you're driving through some really crazy situations where they actually still do planned avalanches. So they do that to stop the highway from being destroyed so that the truckers can cross the whole, you know, all of Canada. But you can imagine then if they have to do planned avalanches, how steep the mountainsides are as you're driving through. So it, it That's pretty well. gives pretty epic scenery. So now we're gonna move on to campgrounds. I have just like three recommendations of must stop campgrounds, but I think what we just kinda of wanna say first is that if you're going in the middle of the summer and you wanna stay at one of the popular campgrounds, especially in near the Banff, Lake Louise area, you're gonna to have to book them out in advance. Uh, we were a little bit nervous about that because we travel on the fly. We don't book things in advance. And we were able to get into Whistler's in Jasper, which was an amazing park with like 750 sites. Um, we were able to just get right in. Um, there was no issue pulling in and getting a site. And we were actually able to stay for two weeks. We had to move once to another site um, within that two weeks, but it was fine. Uh, the other thing to note is there's not a lot of boondocking 
or free camping really close to the parks. But the campgrounds, both Jasper and Banff, have overflow parking lots. So that if you do roll in and you can't get a campsite, they have these over, overflow lots. We found it really interesting that most people traveling through these campgrounds were just staying for like a night and they weren't even there all day. So they would pull in, they'd sleep for the night, get up and go explore again because they were all traveling in these little class C's that they were like, I guess they were kind of rentals. We saw a few class A's and people who, you know, looked out of place like us, <laughs> but for the most part, it was just those smaller campers that were pulling in and out. Again, we got the Heartland Torque and it's, it's big. And some of the, the provincial parks, right, um, were a little tight, not gonna lie, but manageable. Um, for the most part, they always had at least one, two, a few spots that we could always get into. So not a problem. Again, uh, you know, looking at it on paper, looking at it when you drive through, it's definitely designed for smaller rigs. So the smaller the rig, the better, but you can do it with this, uh, this size rig. Whistler's campground was awesome. There was not any huge trees, or I think that actually it was burned not too long ago. So that's, you know, but you were able to fit everywhere. Uh, then we moved down to Banff and we stayed in the overflow lot and there was uh, plenty of room there as well. The other thing I'd like to say is you should stop and camp at the Columbia Icefields Parkway um, campground um, at the Visitor Center. It's halfway between Jasper and Banff at the Columbia Icefields. If you camp at the Columbia Icefields lot, it is dry camping, so you need to be set up for that. But you could always just do it for one night to explore the ice fields. And it's about 1550 Canadian, so it's cheap um, and you can easily stay for a couple nights if you want to. Uh, the next campsite I would highly recommend, we've stayed, we stayed at quite a few up there, but I would say the third and the last one I'd recommend is Wait a Bit Creek, and it's um, just Re north Rec of, Land. it's a recreation site. So it's actually, I think we even had a picnic table and a fire pit, yeah. but it was right on a creek. We pulled up and we were on like this creek that kids could play on the whole time. And just being on the, the teal water like that and then seeing the mountains in the distance, it was probably our favorite campsite ever. So we really enjoyed that. Those are the top three places. So Whistler's, the Columbia Ice Fields, and Wait a Bit Creek. Those are our top three recommendations if you're in Canada. Boondocking. Okay, so we are boondockers. We're fully set up with solar. We have batteries and we love to camp out west in the U.S. So we were really nervous. What is that going to be like in Canada? We started to look on Campendium, which is an app we use to find our free campsites. And we typically go there first always because we can find the most epic sites there. Uh, however, there's not a lot of reviews in Canada on Campendium. So we didn't know what to expect. There are a lot of provincial parks or recreation sites, they call them, and you can't really tell what is it going to be like. But that's kind of how it is in the States too. You kind of have to scout ahead and check things out. But the difference up there is there's a lot of tall trees. So we just didn't know what we would encounter. But we ended up finding um, different places that we could camp and for free. And it really wasn't an issue. The only issue would be the proximity to the park we're trying to explore. So it, in the one at Wait a Bit Creek, the reason that we really liked that one was we were able to explore Glacier, we were able to explore Yoho, we were able to explore, we could have gone over and done Mount Revelstoke, we did the Bugaboos, like five parks that you could explore just by camping there. Um, you do have to drive a little bit though, but we like to park one place and not have to move as much for a couple of weeks. So it made more sense to hop in the truck and go explore for the day. So anyway, don't be afraid to try to find free campsites in Canada. If you go on Canada site, I'll try to link it um, in the video. As far as fueling our Heartland Torque with water and taking the sewage out, we always found a place to do that, whether that be a provincial or, um, you know, federal, I don't know what Canada's thing is, but some, some park or, you know, a gas station that has an RV dump. Uh, we always found a place, uh, for instance, in Golden, it was as long as you, as long as you paid for five dollars in goods or something, yeah, ten dollars like, in gas, something like that. Yeah, I, I had to pay like five Canadian dollars in fuel, which you know we we parked in a pretty heavily wooded spot, so we had to run the generator quite a bit. So no problem. Every time I just run up there, fill up the gas can, and then dump the tanks, and it was absolutely free after that. We also have a macerator pump, so we were able to pump our gray and black water out easily. 
uh, we can show you a clip of that as well because it's it's really convenient when we're camping yep. off grid to be able to go and dump someplace because we need to respect the environment, right, pack out your trash, leave the sites better than you found them. We're in someone else's country, even when you're in our country, we need to be cleaning up. Yeah, absolutely. You know, speaking of that, continue the boondocking. I have an old saying, you know, never waste a trip to town. You at least need to dump your tanks, get water, get fuel, whatever you got to do. Just don't make it a wasted trip. Get some resource to bring back. Then our last boondock spot, we were primarily in the Columbia River Valley, and that feeds right down to Montana, just north of Whitefish. So guess what? We continued that road and not a lot of terrain to go over. And we continued that road down and did the border crossing north of Whitefish. I don't have a name for you, I'm sorry. Uh, but we went through there and that border crossing, we got a great guy. Uh, he really liked the e-bikes that we store on the front of the truck. And he really liked our, our Heartland Torque here. Yeah, he liked it, that and our stickers on it. He was very friendly and basically said, did you have fun? I said, heck yeah, I did and waved us through and that yeah. was, it was one of our good, better better border crossings it was the best border crossing so to go from the worst going in to the best going out was fine it was wonderful we were so happy that day because i had so much anxiety after the going into canada that i didn't even want to leave because i didn't want to have to cross another border but it was great we felt so good that moment i remember <laughs> feeling so happy to be back in the states and have an easy crossing yeah let's break down the cost so um, in Canada, everything is more expensive. I don't know, don't know when you're watching this video, but the dollar was strong against the Canadian dollar. But still, even after the conversion, it felt, and I know, <laughs> everything was like 25 to 50% more than I would usually pay for everything. Granted, we were in the high rent district of right, being around the national parks, being in the tourist areas. We understand that, but um, it was a pricey venture for us, right? Yeah, there was one shop, the, the little grocery store in Lake Louise specifically, where we went in to just get like uh, fizzy waters. Uh, that's what we call them, sparkling waters. And we we're just going to get a 12 pack or an eight pack. And I think that was $13 for that. <laughs> 13 Canadian, I think, right? Yeah, 13 Canadian. Yeah, so, so. so. Um, but yeah, I'll try to put a calculator, a link to a calculator so you can kind of see what your costs are going to be. But everything's more expensive. Like I said, all your goods are going to be about 25% more. That was my rule of thumb while we were there. I knew I was going to spend that. Um, we primarily stayed in British Columbia, which is, you know, the higher tax, the higher fuel tax area. Um, but in Banff, if you could go down the road a little bit to the next town down. Canmore. Yeah, and you can get some cheaper prices because you're not going to get taxes heavy. And also the fuel's a lot cheaper. So fuel really broke the bank uh, when it came to being in Canada. It was, it was ridiculous. Uh, maybe not for you Californians, but, you know, it was seven, seven something dollars a gallon of fuel after I converted it all, um, which I wasn't happy about. But then if I went over to Kenmore? Can Canmore. Canmore you know, it was right in the $4 range. So that's how drastic different that provincial or how we would think a state line would be. It was very expensive on the British Columbia side. Yeah. No, gas was, I would say fuel and groceries are going to be your biggest cost. Camping wasn't that expensive for us, but we did find free campsites. But even the National Park campsites, you could pay anywhere from $25 to $50, depending if you wanted full hookups or not. So it's very comparable to the states. I wouldn't say that was any different. And experiences were, I would say, pretty similar to the states as well. I think that the yeah. pricing on the excursions and things that we did were not that much more in Canada. Okay, so thank you so much if you're still here. We were so happy to share our adventures in Canada with you. And we hope that you get yourself up to the Canadian Rockies because it is one of the most beautiful places we have ever seen. And we will definitely be going back because even by spending a summer there, it was not enough time to see it all. So hopefully we'll see a different season next time and explore some new places. Yeah, the sun's going down, so we got to go. All right, like, subscribe, comment, share. Hit some bells. <laughs> Hit some bells. Whatever we do on here. <laughs> all right, that's good.